Um, I am Melvia Yesayan. I'm the interim director of Oxy Arts. I am uh, here um, in, in place of uh, Dina Seleno, who is Oxy Arts director. She'll be uh, out on maternity leave through J uh, July. She'll be back then. So um, briefly, I'll let you know a little bit about Oxy Arts. You may already know, but Oxy Arts is the hub for arts and culture here at Occidental College. It's a tool for connecting on and off campus partners for amplifying the amazing work being done by our individual arts departments and is also its own interdisciplinary arts programming initiative. So we program lectures, panels, workshops, exhibitions, and student initiatives that bring the community together in socially engaged dialogue through the arts. Um, you can check out our website. If you are an off-campus community member, sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. We have a number of upcoming and current events that I'd like to share with you. Uh, we encourage you to check out Kenyatta Hinkle's exhibition currently up at the Weingart Gallery. It's awesome. You should definitely see it before it closes. Tomorrow at 11.45 a.m. we have a creative exchange workshop in Lower Herrick to dialogue around our new physical space that's opening up uh, on York Boulevard this fall. You may have heard about that. Um, so come let your voice be heard and tell us how you feel. Um, and at 4.30 p.m. tomorrow, we have artist Candace Lynn, who is our Wanless Artist in Residence for next fall. She will present on her practice and discuss the class she will teach next fall. Um, next month, we have Amatisse Modavalli in the Weingart Gallery. Amatisse was the second speaker in our, in our um, speaker series this year. And later in April, on April 19th, here at Choi, we have a screening of the documentary Queer Historical Mixtape. We hope you can come to some or all of these upcoming events. Also, I know that the uh, Toronto Burke talk is happening tonight in Thorne, and we're going to try to wrap this up a little early so that people who intend to go see uh, Toronto Burke are able to. So, um, Now about the Oxy Art Speaker Series. Our Oxy Art Speaker Series brings five interdisciplinary artists collectives to campus each year to share with us about why they do what they do in LA today. The Oxy Art Speaker Series is made possible by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Arts and Urban Experience Grant, so we're very grateful for our funders. Uh, our featured speaker this evening is Justin Chan. Justin is a filmmaker and actor. His second feature film, Gook, is a look into the 1992 uprising in Los Angeles from the perspective of the Korean American community. The film is based on Justin's own family as store <coughs> owners during that time. And uh, the film was released in August of 2017 to incredibly positive reviews, including the coveted Audience Award at Sundance last year. Um, members of Ox the Oxy Arts team met Justin at the USC Forward Los Angeles Conference, which was a 25-year commemoration conference of the LA Uprising. Justin was presenting his film there, and Oxy Arts felt he would be a great addition to our speaker series this season. Thank you to Allegra Padilla, who was one of the people who recommended we bring Justin here. Um, thank you, Justin, for accepting our invitation, and welcome to Oxy. Cool. Uh, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I'm not too familiar with with this room, but like, um, how many people are, are filmmakers? Awesome. Um, how many people uh, like films? Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess I'm supposed to talk about uh, why I do what I do and how uh, that pertains to me being an Angelino. <laughs> um, first of all, I was, you know, I've been a Southern California native my entire life. I was born in Garden Grove. Uh, some people call it Garbage Grove. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, and uh, I grew up mostly in Irvine. I grew up a few years in Chula Vista. It's uh, as south as you can go before you hit Tijuana. And um, and I uh, yeah, I've been in LA for a while now. Um, I started. I went to USC and I started college in '99. So I've been in LA for a long time. Um, uh, as it pertains to this film that I'm here for. Um, I, I did uh, 
I made a film called Gook, and um, it happens uh, during the first day of the LA riots. It's about two brothers, two Korean American brothers, who are struggling to run their late father's women's shoe store. Um, and uh, it's also about their friendship with a neighborhood uh, African American girl. Uh, she's 11. Um, how many people here have, have seen that film? Okay, so I guess uh, for you guys who haven't seen it, I think to give some a little bit of context, I'll just, I guess I'll show the trailer. So that's the trailer, um, and uh, I guess to give a little bit of background, uh, you know, my uh, we my parents immigrated here in the late '70s, um, and my dad uh, worked the. Uh, if you're from Southern California, you know about the swap meets. My dad worked the swap meets for like you know uh, over 10 years, and uh, he sold shoes, um, and. It, it, after he was able to open a storefront, he opened it in uh, Paramount or right across the bridge from East Compton, uh, across the 7th Freeway, and uh, and we were there. You know, uh, when the riots happened in 92, we got looted on the last day of the riots, and um, I have a very sort of personal experience with the event. Um, yeah, and over the years, you know, as an actor, I've been acting for 17 years now, and and uh, you know, I've auditioned for so many versions of the of an LA Wright's film. You know, I've auditioned for Spike Lee's version that never got made, um, and a lot of other versions of the film. And I always felt that you know, um, a lot of it tends to be you know a black and white issue. Um, but financially, you know, Koreans were also affected. They're actually affected the most financially. And um, you know, I think that's what great art does. Is is you know, you you make things that are very personal to you. And I felt that having experienced uh, the uprising um, very intimately, I thought it was uh, my responsibility to tell the story from a Korean American perspective uh, and be at the table for the conversation. Um, it's the reason I made it. Um, 
and it was a huge departure from my first film, which is like a total stoner comedy. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I thought it was really important, and um, it sort of, uh, you know, I was telling this group I just spoke to that uh, in the beginning of my career, I just wanted to be an actor, and you know, I just constantly hoped that as long as uh, I was booking jobs and doing what I love and just making enough to to make a living that that was enough but you know year after year when you have no say in how your you know your ethnicity is portrayed um, you start to get really frustrated and uh, as an Asian American male the roles that I'm allowed to play uh, are never written by Asian Americans most of the time and you know the roles are usually uh, stereotypical. So, you know, with this film, it was really important for me because, uh, you know, a lot of the kids that I grew up with weren't, uh, you know, going to Stanford or Harvard. And a lot of them were really blue collar, you know, grew up in blue collar families and they just wanted to uh, make ends meet. I know a lot of people like that. Um, and I thought it was a section of our community that wasn't. Um, accurately portrayed. Also, if you know anything about the uprising, there was a huge, huge racial tension at the time between African Americans and Koreans, mainly because uh, you know Koreans were in their neighborhoods uh, running liquor stores and groceries, and you know um, getting the loans that they weren't getting. And uh, there was a huge gap in cultural understanding. So it was important for this film to re-examine those relationships and you know it was my conversation about uh, where we're at as a society not in terms of even just you know uh, Koreans and, and African Americans but as a whole and to kind of gauge because last year was the 25th anniversary of the riots and uh, it was a conversation about how much we've either progressed or haven't and uh, the answer to that is, we've progressed in certain ways, but in a lot of ways, I think we've regressed. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, you know, film in that way, you can sneak in the medicine. And I always think that great films do. You know, um, I just saw uh, Black Panther uh, opening day, and fuck, that was awesome. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, from what I've heard, you know, Ryan Coogler, he grew up in the Bay and, you know, growing up he's done like youth outreach and, and uh, been a counselor to troubled youth kids. And I was so surprised how much of his own story he was able to bleed into a Marvel huge studio film. That is just incredible. And I just, I was so impressed and I was so awestruck of how he was able to still instill uh, kind of who he is, his identity, into uh, such a big film. You know, usually the studios will will totally tell you what to do and, and you know, to get watered down, but I just felt like it was such a triumph. And, you know, it was really important because uh, it, it demonstrated that it just broke all the sort of preconceived notions that an all-black cast can't. Um, you know, have box office success. It also broke the mold with um, what kind of stories can be told that are going to be popular. And uh, it gives me hope as an Asian American filmmaker that, uh, you know, I too can make a film like that at one point and also infuse uh, my cultural ID into my artwork. Um, you know, I think. I think uh, my fil favorite filmmakers aren't necessarily Asian American, and um, you know, I love uh, so many. You know, uh, Michelle Gondry or uh, you know Jim Sheridan or or um, you know Kieslowski or like you know a lot of the European filmmakers, and I feel that you know. If I can learn from all these, you know, you know, amazing filmmakers around the world, and I can make American films that, you know, speak 
to uh, masses worldwide, I think, I think I can, um, you know, have a very interesting perspective. Even if I were to make a film that uh, is like an Avengers or something, no matter what, my sort of, it'll get fil filtered through my instrument and, and I think, uh, uh, you know, it's inevitable that there's a different lens that the story is told. Um, I guess, you know, I think the way I can be the most of service to you guys here is, um, you know, answering questions because, you know, if there's anything in particular you want to know about my journey, because I could just talk and I think that might get old real quick. Um, but if you guys have specific questions, I think it could be of more service than me kind of, you know, um, you know, having a specific agenda on my part. So, um, you know, I'd rather have a com an open dialogue with you guys rather than me just talk for for an hour. Um, so yeah, you know, like whoever wants to ask the first question, I'd just love to talk to you guys. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Mickey. Uh, yeah. I'm a senior here. My question's about your experience in academia as an Asian American male. Um, I think really often I don't see myself within academia, um, particularly like the subjects that I study, which yeah. is like social justice related issues, mm. which like they're around, but it's it's not um, so heavily discussed. And I was wondering what your experience was like navigating academia. Mm. Uh, I'm really not that academic. <laughs> um, I, you know, I went to SC and. I was just trying to figure figure shit out and um, um, I think at the, you know, I don't know, like uh, I think it's important. I think what you do is really important and it all, you know, all the source material and stuff that I, I study in order to research for my films all comes from academia. Um, you know, for Gook, uh, a lot of the LA Riot stuff, some of it was from my own, oh, so, you know, it was from my own dad. And, um, but a lot of it was through documentaries and, and also, um, you know, microfish and, you know, stuff that's cataloged and now we have the internet, but all that is possible because academics catalog these things and, and make it available for, for the masses and I think it's extremely important. I guess uh, my opinion about Asian Americans in, in academia, it's important because, um, you know, you're the one that are, are cataloging our experience in this country. You know, and so the reason I thought that uh, telling a L.A. Riots film from a, from a Korean American standpoint was very important because in the sort of, um, you know, scope of, of films, I didn't think it was going to be made. It's definitely not going to be made in the, the studio setting. Uh, even in the indie film setting, it was incredibly hard to get financing for it. So uh, I thought it was important that it was out there um, and a perspective on it was out there. Um, but you know, when I was making the film, there's a lot of things I didn't know, you know, and, and that all came from you know people who, and I got a lot of help, you know, people offering resources and stuff. And I thought um, it wouldn't uh, the specifics of uh, the event wouldn't have been as accurately portrayed if. I didn't, I didn't have access to that. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Sandy. I'm a first year. Hey, Sandy. Um, so I just wanted to start off by saying, like, I think it's incredibly important and amazing that you created this film that sort of talks about um, the relationship between Black and Asian American communities. Because mm -hmm. I feel like that's a topic that is, like, one of the most American things I think ever, which is like really interesting. But anyway, um, so like I'm from Chicago, and so mm. of course um, I grew up in a predominantly black community, also daughter of like Asian business owners who work in a black community. And I feel like there's a hyper awareness there of you know of Asian Americans being a guest in that space and being a guest in that yeah. community because very much for a lot of my life I realized like yeah like I get to live pretty comfortably off of like you know, black patronage, black dollars. Um, so I guess what I wanted to know or ask was in the creation of 
creation of this film and maybe in your own experiences, what is something that you feel that Asian Americans specifically can get from this in terms mm -hmm. of interactions with the black community? Because I feel like, like, one of the shittiest things that I have, like, you know, learned in being a person is, like, how prevalent anti-blackness is in the Asian community. Yeah. When that's so unfortunate and there should be a solidarity there in being two communities of color, but, you know, it works out. It's not like that all the time. Yeah, so I'll tell you this. Um, all my all my first opportunities, all my firsts as an actor, Asian American actor, were all given to me by by African Americans. Um, from you know, <laughs> from the very beginning, uh, I did this. I did this movie, you know, like I'm embarrassed by it now, but I'm not embarrassed by the opportunity, but I had this movie called Wendy Wu, right? On Disney Channel, right? <laughs> but, I, but you know, the producer, the producer of that, 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 you know, that, that Disney Channel movie was Ralph Farquaad. And he is an OG of, of uh, you know, entertainment industry. And he's, he's a black man and he, you know, um, He's been around forever, and he has given so many starts to so many minority, uh, uh, te minority talent, and he championed me uh, in the beginning of my career, and I really wouldn't have a career without him. Um, you know, and then I did this show for, for uh, Just Jordan, it was on Nickelodeon, and I did, um, and that was given to me by Allison Taylor, who was a black woman, and, you know, it's so funny because None of my first opportunities were given to me by Asian Americans, like Asian American producers. Asian Amer none, no roles were written for me by Asian American writers or uh, given to me by Asian American directors. And you're right, there should be solidarity. And there is like, you know, um, I think there's a lot more similar that's dissimilar. You know, I was. You know, I was just talking to the Korean Student Association, and there's this thing that Korean people have. It's called uh, chung, right, or han. Black people have that too. And what that is 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 han is is a fire that comes out from inside, and it's just this. You know, whether it comes out through anger or passion or whatever. Watch any black film; it's in there. You know, uh, chung is just like an affinity for somebody. Just you don't know why, but you just have a kinship with somebody and that's, you know, these are things that, that in the English language they don't have verbiage or they don't have like uh, words assigned to them but, but I think there's a reason that these two communities in certain ways also really relate to one another and that's what this film is about. I mean, the core of it, you know, when people ask like this film is about, uh, you know, the LA riots and blah 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 but when you watch the film, what the film is really about, what I, I snuck the medicine in, what the film is really about, it's about friendship. It's about a friendship between this Korean store owner and an 11 year old black girl. And to me, when I went out and tried to get financing for this film, everybody told me that was crazy. They're like, that doesn't make sense. That's like, oh, I don't know how that works. Like, it's gonna be weird. And I'm like, no, it's not. And you watch the film and, and you don't even think about it after like the first few minutes and it's what makes the film work but I, I, I think that that um, you know it, me as a filmmaker my purpose is you know um, as an Asian American that's where I add value is bringing my perspective but also it's like how to show that we're all much more alike than different um, and what are the commonalities and what are the things that, that bring us together and I think uh, that's important for me as a filmmaker to to um, you know showcase that, and you know uh, in this film in particular, there's tension, and the you know the brother of of the the, the African American girl, he hates the the um, the Korean family, but it was for different reasons. Her, his his mom worked for uh, the uh, store, and both the Korean dad and the black mother. They got shot and killed outside the store. So they have a shared pain, but of course, like, it's like when you're in that much pain, who do you blame other than the people that, that, that the establishment where it happened? And it's just about like, at the end of the film, it's really important that they look at one another and um, I don't know if you guys are gonna watch the film or not, but, but um, 
but uh, something really tragic happens and, and you can't point fingers at it anymore. And I don't pick sides. I don't pick like the Korean side or the black side. I'm just showing, look what happens when people don't talk to one another and communicate. That's what the film like showcases is that at the end of the day, they both lose when there's not an open dialogue. And, and that goes for everyone, not just the uh, black and Korean community. It goes for all sort of uh, color lines. And, um, you know, especially now, we're at a really, really volatile time where everything's so divided. I don't really see a lot of people listening. You know, at least having trying to have empathy for something that you might not think you believe in at all. You gotta at least listen and then make a decision. And I don't see really that happening right now. So that's, you know, I thought this film right now came at a very pertinent time. Sorry. No, it's okay. I got another follow up question. Yeah. Um, but for like actors of color as well as filmmakers of color or just any like creator, like, you know, like what is your advice to, for us to like get our foot in the door? Um, because like I feel like everybody has a start um, and I'm super fascinated to how you got from like, you know, being a student at USC to like where you are now. Well, you know, I'm an actor first. I, w I was an actor first and that's my first love. It's my main bitch. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, you know, that's how I learned how to film make was being on so many sets and seeing, I'm just like, I would see like these people who aren't any more talented than I am. And I'm like, how did you get people to like, let you direct this and, get, and put you in charge of like $30 million? I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I think that's the first thing is to understand that the barrier is not as great as you think. It's, it's really, the voodoo behind it is really not that big of a difference between you and the person who's actually doing it. It's just about like acquiring the skill set to, to, to close that gap. Uh, you know, filmmaking is a, is a totally learnable skill. It's technical. And I think um, once you understand that it's not magic, like if I said, hey, I'm going to teach you a magic trick, and I gave you, I gave you some time to, to learn it, you'd be able to do it. And that's what filmmaking is. It's like, it's just the steps that you, you do to give off this, this show, right? But it, it all is just technical skills, and it's just how much you practice. So, you know, the skill part, you can learn. I mean, dude, with the digital age right now, like, you can learn how to do anything in film, from After Effects, uh, you can see all the behind the scenes on the, of how they put together like a Marvel movie and you know you can learn about all that stuff like uh, lenses and and you know all the different traits of different lenses you can learn all that stuff what a, you know a dolly is what a techno crane is how to utilize it how to operate it even so that's not a, even an excuse like there's no barrier to entry in that in that terms what the, where there is a barrier to entry is like you're saying the foot in the door like how do you get the shot well come on uh, you know, in this day and age, you know, I don't know if you guys know a movie called Tangerine. It's made by Sean Baker. He made it on a fucking iPhone. And it, it went to Sundance, it killed, and he just made the Florida Project. He, 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 he didn't want to shoot it on uh, an iPhone, you know, and he wanted to shoot it on film, but he couldn't wait anymore. And, you know, he made, he made, four or five films before that. So like here this guy is that already has like four or five films and he's won many awards and he still can't get money for another feature so he makes it on an iPhone but it kills and then they have some faith in him and he goes makes a Florida project now William Defoe's nominated for an Oscar that's incredible. So there's no excuse on telling your story either and I think that's really important to know is uh, that barrier to entry is non-existent as well. And there's platforms that showcase your work, Vimeo, YouTube, and if it's good, people will find it, you know? And when I made, when I made Gook, not a single person gave me money that I thought would. You know, after my first film, I thought, there's so many people that came to me and said, hey, when you make your next film, let me know, I will invest. 
And you know, some of these people, like you know, to be even part more more specific, were from Silicon Valley, and they're like hundred millionaires. When it came time, I wasn't asking for the whole budget. I wasn't even asking for. I was like, just give me a portion of it. They all scattered like cockroaches, you know. So it was like, what do I do? Do I just wait for someone to give me permission, or do I just do it? You know, and it, yeah, I came. I went to my producer. I said, "What is a minimum, like absolute minimum, we can make this film for?" And he gave me a number, and I said, "Okay, we're gonna make it for ten thousand less than that." And you know, I found like-minded people who were willing to to uh, work for a very discounted rate, and also like um, actors who were just as passionate about the content um, to come on. And you know, the African American brother Keith. I found him in New York through, and the way I found him was uh, through my other indie filmmaker friends. I said, "Hey, who is like the young, up-and-coming black dude? He just is an undiscovered treasure." And they're all like Curtis Cook Jr. And I was like, "Okay." So I met up with him, and I didn't even tell him anything about the movie. And I we just had a great time that night. We just went and and drank and had a good time. I didn't just as a friends, you know, it's like you know another actor, another actor. I just want to meet some actors in New York. And then I was like, "Oh, dude, I could spend two months with this dude." So when I went back to California, I just emailed him and I said, hey, "I have the script. Do you want to take a look at it? Like, would you be interested in playing this role?" And he was like, "Yeah." The dude slept on my couch for like a month and a half. He was there every day, even when he wasn't in the in the film. It wasn't shooting. I was like, "Dude, Curtis, you need to like go somewhere else, bro. <laughs> like, you're like, you're like too much right now." But like, I love the dude. But like, I it was about like getting like-minded people, uh, you know, it was like my sort of family that I built to make a project that I believed in, but you, there's no reason you can't do that. Uh, get an iPhone and get a Zoom and plug a, you know, uh, uh, plug it into a boom and you, you got it, you know. Um, you can edit on pirated software. I'm not telling you to pirate software. <laughs> but you can do it if you want. I mean, there's a ways to get it done or borrow a computer. But uh, there's no excuse anymore for, for making your content anymore and getting your, your, your films out there. Um, you know, I don't want to hear it, you know, like, so I can't wait to see your film. Yeah. Um, I'm Rand. Hey, Rand. Um, on top of that, there is also what you just said. There is also a tradi more traditional approach to filmmaking, and I've heard uh, stories from my friends who worked on a set on Andrew Lau's film in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and they have something called paying your dues. I know Andrew Lau very well. Yeah, yeah. Which is to uh, um, bring coffee and work as a PA and, and uh, help people do stuff on set. Yeah. And now that so many people are finding fame and careers. Um, through platforms like YouTube or social media. Like right now it's the golden range of social media. So sure. people are finding careers through that path that has opened up. Can you talk more about the crossover between working on professional sets yeah. and also pursuing a career in the in an amateur sense? Yeah. Um, I don't think YouTube is amateur, you know, I think it's I have friends who do YouTube and uh, some of them are very structured. Um, I think art is art. I think if you put thought behind something and you create something, it's just as valid as a $150 million movie. It might not have as much reach because you don't have the marketing dollars, but it doesn't mean it's any less of uh, a message. Yeah, in terms of production value, uh, there's a big difference. Um, in terms of the crossover, you know, and I worked with Angela, I did a film with him, and um, yeah, there is that traditional sense of pay or dues, and there's no right answer to how you get to where you're going, but I think what I found as a filmmaker and what's important to me is uh, the purpose behind it. Like, what is my goal? Where am I trying to get to? And I think that um, when that's clear, you'll find your way. To how to get there, and I think there's a lot of different ways. And if social, if going through more of the social media route is your way, more power to you. But there is a traditional way um, that you know somebody like Andrew Lau cultivates. It's like first you you are a PA, you get coffee, and then you know, maybe you you start moving lights, and then and then uh, 
they let you uh, handle the electricity and then you become a grip and then you become best boy and then there is that ladder. The advantage to that is that you learn technical skills. In social media, doing it through YouTube, it's harder to get access to that knowledge and being around people who have been doing it for decades. That's the difference. Um, I think there is potential for crossover and I think it is important because there's something to be learned from social media and how they utilize their audiences that films a lot of times cannot. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the news with like Kylie Jenner and how she tweeted about how she said like um, Snapchat is dead and then their stock fell like billion dollars. I don't give a shit, that's power. Like even if the president said, said hey, Snapchat sucks, it's not gonna drop a, a few billion dollars. Uh, and you know, people talk shit about the Kardashians or whatever, think that's lesser content. I don't think so. Like, they've built an empire and, and uh, the fact that a woman can put out a tweet and has a power to financially, you know, move the needle, that is insane. Um, so I think if, you know, in terms of crossover, how do you maximize both ends, you know? And, and I guess, uh, are you a filmmaker? So you're a filmmaker, and I think, you know, um, you know, I was telling you, like, go make your film, but also you need to be smart and uh, start to think about how can you utilize what is at your fingertips now and these tools for, for people to see it. And I don't think that you should operate in a vacuum either. You know, um, all that stuff is very important. You know, I could make, you know, I, I, I made Gook, and it wasn't an accident that I, I you know, my brother in the film is a, is a YouTube star. Now, I didn't just expect him to show up and succeed. We did two months of rehearsal every day, and he busted his ass. And I, I also wrote the role for him to play to his strengths. But I'm not dumb. Like, I knew that if he's in there, you know, he has, like, I don't know, like, uh, it's close to 2 million subscribers or whatever on YouTube. I know at least 2 million people are gonna at least have heard of it, you know, and I um, I think why wouldn't I use that to my advantage? I'm not saying that like you hire all YouTubers or like I think that's how it crosses over. You mix and match and make it work for you. Yeah. Hello. Hi, I'm Jean. Hey, Jean. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, as an Asian American actor, like the most important thing is, are you good at acting? Uh, have you gotten proper training? Like, you know, I always make this analogy. Um, you know, like working as a professional actor on network television or in studio films, you're basically in the NBA of you're in the brain surgery of what you do. You can't expect to step on the court and like destroy if you've never dribbled a ball or done your basic fundamentals. So uh, number one is to be an undeniably amazing actor and that just takes training and time. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And then I think it's like, uh, you know, what can you offer that you see there's a, you know, I think it's like how do you get in the door and how do you uh, showcase what only you can do very, very well and get in the door, you know? Like, um, you know, there's this thing about like Ken Jeong, you know, he plays Chow in The Hangover, right? I'm good friends with him and, you know, people kind of don't agree the way he got in the industry, you know? He, he jumps out of a trunk of a car and he, 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 he you know, he's completely buck naked and, you know, like, there's a lot of things that came with that. But you know what? He was playing the long game. You know, uh, in terms of, I think he was a second person in, in American history that had an Asian American sitcom. It wasn't since Margaret Cho in the 90s that an Asian American had a sitcom about just an Asian American family. They were just, they didn't have accents. They were just a regular family, just like, you know, I guess like the George Lopez show or whatever, right? But he, you know, it's like, 
He had to do what he had to do, and and I don't fault that, you know. Um, and it's hard out there, and it's like you got to look at yourself and be like, what can I offer? And uh, that's different um, because it is like it's acting. It's like how are you? Like why do I want to hire you over you? It's a very subjective job. So I think um, what can you do to set yourself apart? But you know, first off. You better be insanely you know, amazing, and don't compare yourself to other, you know, people in your ethnicity. Just be a fucking good actor, just in general, you know. Um, yeah, that's that's my advice. Um, what was it like directing You know, to be honest, I didn't want to act in it. It was for budget reasons. We just didn't have enough money, so like. <laughs> I paid myself and then I put it back into the, the project. I lost money on that film. Um, um, and the other thing was, it was uh, shorthand. I rehearsed with all the actors. So they had already rehearsed with me. And, um, you know, there's, I don't, I don't, you can't direct to your fullest because you're in the scene. But like, there's things you can do that you can't do if you're just watching a monitor. One thing is, I had an 11-year-old girl, and uh, I would direct her sometimes by changing my performance. When the camera's on her, I would uh, change my performance in order to get a different response from her. Um, if I wanted to be scared, obviously, I'd do something different. If I wanted to be, you know, um, frightened, I'd do something, you know, if I, would, if I wanted to be more elated, I would do, I'd give her a performance, I would solicit that. So in that way, uh, there was a convenience there, but it's not, it's not fun and I don't recommend it. Um, you know, that's why, um, you know, uh, you know, I think, didn't Ben Affleck go to Occidental? Yeah. yeah. He went to Occidental. Oh, <laughs> boo on him. Uh, but you know, he acts in the films that he directs. Um, and you know, sometimes they're really great and sometimes they're, you know, but, but he's an amazing filmmaker, you know, he's an amazing filmmaker and I, I, I think that when he can just concentrate on the acting, it's. I'm sure he would agree that it's. It's. Uh, he can give a better performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to working with David So. Yeah. Um, so I grew up watching him. He was like one of my big inspirations. Um, what was it like uh, having him in more like a serious, dramatic role as opposed to actually like a lot of the content that I'm used to watching him is like comedy. Uh huh. Well, that's you know that's sort of my purpose. I mean, that's you know I think um, uh, as Asian American, like how do I show how do I in terms of crossover? I was like, how do we you know YouTube is such a space where the people get to vote who they want to watch, and you know the type of talent that's come out of YouTube has been really sort of interesting. The type of people that people want to watch, and I thought David was always talented, and I'm like, okay, let's show that like this guy isn't just one dimensional and can't can do something else besides comedy. And I was like, that's what I pitched to him as well. I was like, hey, let's show people a different side of you that they haven't seen. And you know, when, when Hollywood says there's no good Asian American talent, we all, that's, that's bullshit, you know? Um, and that's part of my sort of thing was to showcase some great talent across you know, different ethnicities. And undiscovered, you know, that's, I love, that's, I take a lot of joy in, in putting people on, you know, like, how do I, uh, show this person, like Curtis, you know, Curtis, I was just like, dude, this guy's so incredible, I saw a short he was in, I was just like, this guy's incredible, this guy's like an undiscovered gem, like, I want to put him on, I want to make sure that people know who he is, um, and that's, I think that's important, you know, so it's not just, not the same faces we see in every freaking movie, you know. Yeah. Why did you choose to make your film in black and white? So she, her question was, why did I choose to make this film in black and white? And the inspiration for this film was uh, La Haine. Um, it's a French film from the early 90s, and it was also in black and white, and it has a lot of similar themes as this film. It has three disenfranchised, like, young guys. One's black, one's Algerian, and one's French, and they're they're kind of traipsing around Paris, and uh, this one guy got beat by the cops, and the, he's in the hospital, and they're waiting to see if he's gonna wake up from a coma, 
and it's what put Vincent Cassell on the map, that film. And Vincent Cassell has a gun and he keeps being like, I'm gonna kill a cop tonight, I'm gonna kill a cop tonight. And, but you know, you find out through the movie that he's so vulnerable and, and uh, you know, that film had a huge impact on me. And it was so interesting that that mirrored uh, what was going on in you know, South Central at the same time. Um, so it was a big influence. So it was like uh, black and white, that, that was a huge influence, so I, I did that. But also black and white, it makes you not, after you know, about like 10 minutes, you stop looking so much at the aesthetic. You stop like focusing so much on the production design, or whatever, you really start to focus on the relationships and the, the people. Um, because you're not bombarded by, by bright colors and, and the cinematography. I mean, even though I think the cinematography is beautiful, uh, thanks to our DP, but um, I thought that you start to really hone in on, on these characters and you start to feel like you're spending the day with them. You know, and it gives it this sort of docu-realistic, uh, you know, feeling towards a film. Not with Gook because no one's gonna give me money anyway. So I was gonna, I was, I was, I was gonna tell the story I want to tell. Um, and I think when you go, you know, when you go into the studio system, you know, I dealt, I, you know, after Gook, I got offered a few things, and you know, I've started to navigate that space in the studio space. And yeah, there's a lot of negotiation, and ultimately, when you do a film that's the budget's really big. It's hard to make really risky choices because there's a lot of money on the line, you know? There's a lot of commerce involved. But I think for smaller films, uh, for independent films, uh, that's the beauty of them. That's, you know, the sort of the spice and the flavor of, of these films is you can take bigger risks. You can cast unorthodox, like, you know, unconventional people and, and uh, you get to tell stories that are very intimate to yourself. Um, which is, uh, you know, which is why I love independent film. Uh, I really wish that America, the United States, would subsidize and, and give a lot of support to artists, and uh, which they do in like Sweden, and they give these amazing grants through the government to filmmakers for them to make, you know, films that are very visionary and give them the resources because you know films are is just a, such an expensive art form. Um, so to make something grandiose happen, it costs money. And it's hard for Americans, uh, American films to make those, those uh, take those risks because uh, they have to worry about making the, the money back. You know, so like, you know, filmmakers like Lars von Trier or, or uh, Nick Reffin with like, you know, all his crazy films, you know. <laughs> those would not be, you know, they're very hard to make in the US. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think they should be made. So I'm fourth generation Japanese, and uh, like a lot of my personal art practice, because I'm an illustrator and sculptor mainly, uh, like revolves around like really heavy shit, like intergenerational trauma or like yellow fever, and just things that are like very consuming by nature. I think. Yeah. Um, so I think like like that, and then additionally, um, like when you take on big projects where you're not really sure like what the end game is like, apart from like what you want it to like evoke and like what you want it to be about like it's my experience that when I do things like that it's like very mentally taxing and I yeah. become like obsessed or like very consumed by it mm -hmm. so I guess my question then is um, like when you're working on projects like this how do you like how do you go to bed? Like how do you put yourself to sleep at night? And then how do you like wake up? Yeah. It's like really dramatic. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that um, I think that I think that if I could stand behind my piece, mm -hmm. and I feel like I didn't make compromises that that I can't stand behind, then I can go to sleep. Okay. Um, I can wake up if I wake up and I'm excited if it's something that. Uh, me now as a filmmaker, I think it's really exciting when I can give a voice to people who don't have a platform. 
I'm about to, I'm about to do, you know, I have a project that I'm doing uh, about international adoption. I have a project about you know deportation. Right now, that's a hot topic, but like it's my perspective on it, and I think I have a unique take on it that I think is not is unconventional. That I think um, excites me, and but then I can tell that story and also do it in a way that's also entertaining and it's a it's a piece of art that gets me really excited. Um, but in terms of what you're also saying, in terms of commerce with art, I got to ask myself: Is this a stepping stone to get to to get on the soapbox, or is this more of a personal piece? Sometimes you ha you there's compromises to be made to get to that the access to to the resources to make the bigger thing, like the like the Black Panther, right? So like Black Panther, you know, Ryan Kruger first made Fruitvale Station, you know. And uh, that was about a, 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 you know, Oscar Grant got, got shot in the BART, like in the, the subway system. And that was so politically driven. And, but that he made that for a very sm a much smaller budget. But it got so much play. It was very moving. It, it, it won a lot of awards. And it got critical acclaim. So then he was smart. He was so smart. The next film he made was Creed. And he took an existing franchise, um, Rocky. And he put a new spin on it, but then he cast an African American as a lead, and he still got, he still was able to put his elements and play the game. Yeah. But he's, you know, and you know, and use that to then make Black Panther. And when I watch Black Panther, I'm like, you won. Yeah. <laughs> you won the game. Like he totally like masterminded the shit out of that, you know. And and I think, um, but I have to ask myself, like, is this? Can I use this and play the play, you know, because I think you could be a true, true artist, but just be willing to operate in that space, which is usually less resources. But if you want to, you know, operate in sort of a more, uh, have a little bit more resources with art, sometimes you gotta, you gotta know where you can be okay to uh, compromise a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get you into acting in the first place? And like, do you have some sort of role model, like, like a famous actor or filmmaker? That yeah. So okay, there's two things. Number one is my my dad is is in this film. You know, he plays a liquor store owner across the street. My dad was a child actor in Korea from ten to twenty five. So I grew up watching his black and whites. I just didn't think it was possible as a you know living in the U S. You know, I grew up in the eighties and. I had Bung Dok Dung, you know. I had, I had Bruce Lee, and I just wasn't coordinated enough to be a good martial artist. I don't know. <laughs> so you know um, that, but you know, when I was, I think I was uh, 11 or 12. I went to like tennis camp. The camp, like, I don't know why my parents are so so cruel to me. They sent me to tennis camp. I don't know why. But I went to tennis camp and they turned on this movie and it was called A Perfect World. Clint Eastwood directed it. And it was with Kevin Costner and it was about a father and son relationship. And at the end, Kevin Costner gets killed. And, um, and I started bawling my eyes out. I'm at my camp, you know? And everyone's making fun of me, like, oh, you cry, baby. And like, you're, you know, uh, and they just made fun of me. But then, you know, I just remember thinking like, wow, as like an 11 year old, that their performances was so moving that I understood that film. As in, it was a more of an adult film. It was like a jailbird that 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 escapes jail and kidnaps this kid, this this I think Mormon or Jehovah's Witness kid that like had never done uh, trick or treating or anything like that. And that father and son relationship, I just connected it to it so much that it made me emotional. As a 10, 11, that's powerful. Because that's the universality of, of us as humans, how we're all connected and we understand you know, how important those relationships are. And I felt like, wow, uh, if I'm an actor, maybe I can be a part of that. And that got me really excited. And, you know, and I think like when I first started acting, I remember I did this one exercise. You know, I, I'm, my foundation is Meisner. And I did a you know, Meisner exercise and I was, you know, they give you all these like, these like parameters with these 
acting exercises and, and they're like, okay, you have a, you know, you have a family member and, and, you know, you have to have a time parameter. So I created this scenario where my grandma's going to die and I have a minute to tell her whatever I wanted to tell her before she dies, my last chance. So I start talking to her and, you know, you put yourself in that space and I started to get really emotional and then, and then, um, and then I started crying. I started like uncontrollably, I couldn't even control myself. And I just like, my body's shaking, I can't breathe right. And I got so embarrassed, I turned my back to the class and I kept crying. But then the teacher kept screaming like, keep going, your grandma's gonna die. Tell her what you wanna tell her, right? <laughs> so I'm like, you know, with my, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to like get out, you know, what I was gonna say. And then, you know, and then I just, and then I stopped. And then I just remember feeling so embarrassed and I didn't want to turn around because, you know, like uh, the things we're taught, like as men is you don't cry, right? You know, like that's like the old way of thinking is a very archaic, you know, caveman way of thinking is you don't cry because you want to survive, right? You need to be, be able to, you know, fight or whatever. So I was really embarrassed. And then when I, when I finally turned around, the, the class all stood up and they clapped for me. And I was like, holy shit. My whole life, my dad told me, like, there's only three times you cry in your life is when you're born and when each of your parents die. <laughs> and, like, I just, I just started, you know, I got, to, I got to express myself and have this very true sort of experience, and I got applauded for it, and I was just like, this is incredible. If I get paid to do this, even just enough, like, if I can just make enough to eat, and I do this for a living, I'm down. Like, I'm sign me up. And that was, you know, that's... That was the start of why I do what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Hi. Um, how is it working with your dad? My dad is a grumpy man. He's a he's a he's probably the most di difficult person to work with uh, out of any of the cast. But you know that's what's cool about making my own film. Like I got to explore things that I've always kind of just wanted to you know, um, explore with him, you know, especially like the intergenerational thing, you know, issues with, with Asian American, especially men, you know, in my film there's a, I explore a toxicity, uh, Asian American angry toxicity, and uh, how that affects relationships and affects communication. So I got to exp explore that with my dad, and it was a really sort of cathartic uh, experience. And there's a moment in the beginning of the film where he slaps the girl, the 11 year old girl. And we come out and we're like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, you don't slap a kid and we're sticking up for her. And we push him outside the store. We're screaming at you, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, and then I, I just say, I, I, I yell at him and go, fuck you, you know? And then he walks, he walks, he goes, fuck you. And then like, he walks a little bit away and then, and then he turns around and goes, fuck you. And then I go, fuck you. And he, he walks a little bit down the street and he turns around again and goes, fuck you. And I go, fuck you. Like, who gets to say fuck you to your dad like that many times? And obviously we're not gonna just do one take. Uh, you know, we did fucking, you know, I don't know, like 20 takes of that. And, um, but you know, in all seriousness, it was just such a wonderful experience to like have him also see what I do and see him in my element and also, you know, view me as like a professional and as a man. And, and when we went to Sundance, he kept saying how don't even think about calling him to the stage and blah, blah, blah. He's going to wear all his hiking gear. And so, like, he's unpresentable. <laughs> he was the first one up there. You know, when the movie, the credits rolled and they invited the cast and the crew up to the stage, he, he was the first one up there. And he, he, he demanded that he did it. He took the mic from me and did, like, this five-minute speech. <laughs> I didn't even get to talk yet, you know. But, um, but it was cool because I always have that, you know. And, I, you know, I have a daughter now. And, you know, my kid will be able to see that film and and be like that's your grandpa that's me and that's and that's i guess immortalized in, in on the on a hard drive somewhere you know uh, and that's that's cool that's awesome um i'm korean i'm from irvine mm, cool <laughs> um and like my uncle has like a pharmacy in my god grove mm. so like yeah so my question would be like how, like, how did you get to that point, like, with your dad where you could talk about these things? Because, like, right now, I'm, like, I grew up in Irvine, which is, like, really...